Yeah, thank you. Uh, nice that so many people are here. And uh, I want to entertain you a little bit today about uh, remote yacht hacking. So um, the first promise that I can give you is I will start a little bit boring because we have to learn some basic stuff. But then it's becoming more and more fun. But the other thing is uh, 30 minutes I have. Uh, I think I will extend it a little bit, so maybe 45 minutes uh, to show everything, but I hurry up that we get early on lunch. So, but we have enough time for that. Yeah, normally um, i first starting with that movie, but I don't think that we have some audio there uh, now. But um, yeah, as you all know, or, or mostly should know, that it's from the movie Hackers, 1996. By the way, Angelina Jolie's second movie. Um, and at the end, then you see already one of the nice targets against uh, vessels. So they implemented the Da Vinci virus into the cargo ship and tried to uh, let it canter. So is this uh, now, nowadays possible or not? We will see. So we have some um, overviews over that. So I will start with a short introduction of me. Uh, my team, uh, yeah, one by one, or 101, it doesn't matter how you name it. And uh, we look into router and SATCOM vulnerabilities, autonomous ships, and uh, then we have a short Q&A. Um, yeah, why yacht hacking? Has someone an idea wh uh, why yacht and not only uh, vessels? Expensive, Expensive yes. Um, OK. Mostly they are privately owned, or you can charter them. Um, but mostly by people, they have big money. And most of the CEOs are running their own ships and running their businesses from those yachts. So when you target a yacht or the network of a yacht, you maybe can target one of those CEOs uh, who is on a uh, stock and uh, get some information in front of it. Um, how we will do it, we will see later. And, of course, celebrities. Uh, they're renting them, uh, going then to Saint-Tropez uh, or other places and uh, laying there with their ships and around. And uh, yeah, think about then what could happen when you own the uh, network and what could happen when you own the uh, entertainment systems. Maybe the best um, paparazzi system ever. I don't know. OK, a little bit about me. So my Twitter handle is obi-1666. I'm older than the internet. Um, I'm certified um, with a couple of certifications, like a, a forensic analyst, CISSP, and so on. Um, yeah, I'm an electronic specialist. I was working for the German army um, for a helicopter, helicopter services for, uh, for navigation systems. And um, by the way, I'm now, yeah, no, now 31 years as a firefighter working in the volunteer firefighting service. So that's my real passion. And yeah, in my company, I'm working as a security evangelist for the Rosen Group. So we work in the oil and gas industry and uh, of, uh, also in the certification. It's the latest spin off of our company where I do pen testing stuff and that. I'm volunteering in the Garaffel Group. It's a uh, group of uh, hacker nerds at the best or a bunch of. Uh, old hackers, and also in the cavalry where I'm supporting the maritime track since a year. So we have an own chapter for maritime security in that. Yeah, let's start. So in the last past months, there were a couple of uh, newspaper articles about uh, what happened. So how hackers are attacking the shipping industry, hackers carpet, yacht pair laptop. Um, cybercrime on high sea, um, and so on. And this one then was that uh, when I started to think about, okay, um, hmm, maybe there's something more about that. So this was last year. Um, that was the second tragic collision uh, of a U.S. naval warship with a merchant uh, ship. And um, then I make a summary about that. So last year we had four accidents of U.S. Navy ships and yesterday, we had an, a Norwegian frigate collided with a crude oil tanker. So why the hell always uh, military ships uh, colliding with uh, commercial ships? So the, um, 
the rumors came always fast up. Maybe someone hacked the navigation system or satellite system and so on. So, yeah, and I will take a, take a deep into it, uh, what is possible, for example, GPS manipulation and uh, other things. So, to have a brief understanding about that. So, that was the free gate from yesterday. Um, just a small recap about um, maybe fake news or something like that. So, this was the f uh, free gate that was uh, tilting there, and this was the commercial tank ship. Um, and as you can see, uh, this is one of the uh, marine traffic website I took. And here you see, this was in the video footage, there are some scratches uh, on the side. So the video makes you something about, uh, hmm, the ship was colliding into the uh, merchant ship. But when we look at the picture here, this one is taken from June last, uh, this year, so the scratches are still on there. So. It was already damaged, but uh, it has nothing to do with the colliding here or with the Navy ship. So just to recognize uh, that sometimes you have to uh, also verify the news in, uh, in good newspapers. Yeah, vessel, yachts, and so on. A yacht is normally a recreational boat. Um, the term originates from the Dutch word uh, from yachting. And uh, yachting is uh, a, a word for hunting. And uh, the Dutch people or the Dutch government used it um, in the past for hunting uh, pirates in the shallow waters of their uh, lower countries. So there the term came from, from yachting because of small and fast vessels. And um, yeah. And of course, size matters. So when you have a boat up to seven meters, sometimes you maybe have GPS on it and uh, you mostly drive it only near to the coast. Then yachts are starting all already since um, bigger than 10 meters. They mostly have GPS and autopilot uh, sometimes. Then we have super yachts and mega yachts. So mega yachts are the very nice ones uh, above 50 meters and so on. So this one is like a uh, super yacht. It's 40 meters. Um, it's one of the German television uh, celebrities. What we have on board? So we have some kind of um, vessel traffic services. It's a uh, system for that. So I come in detail later on it. So automatic identification systems, autopilot, GPS, uh, radar, camera, thermal imaging, uh, engine control units, um, internet access, entertainment systems, and so on. With all those stuff, is connected through a network. Um, the National Marine uh, Electronic Association, the short term is NMER, they have designed a bus system for ships. Um, here we have a uh, combination about this is an NMER 2000 network, it's uh, a CAN bus, and we have here the serial bus, it's NMER 0183, so it's a serial bus. And um, everything is connected here together, all the uh, systems like engine monitor system going on a CAN bus, battery system, display of, uh, of the captain, uh, the compass, uh, we have here a laptop with a gateway to the CAN bus, speed transducers, deep transducers, radar, GPS, wind transducers, everything is connected to those uh, bus in the middle, so the CAN bus. So this is how it looks like. Um, Looks like as in the older cheaper net days, so you have uh, T connectors to connect everything together and we need also uh, terminators at the start and the end of the bus. So it's just like a cheaper net. What do we have there? So this is the old standard. It's a, a serial protocol, it's very slow and um, the need was for more speed. So then they started with um, with the CAN bus that I used then, and then we have already a speed up to one megabit. So nowadays, I think since 2010, most of the newer ships are uh, developed with um, a CAN bus or the NMR 2000 bus. And what you have to do is, it's different than in the car industry. The NMR bus is very well documented. So when you build your own stuff, or want to build your own stuff, you have to buy the documentation about that and then you can certify your system against that. 
and uh, you you have a very well standardized uh, messages how the bus system is working. So it makes it easier also for uh, reversing the protocols on that. So this is already the next generation. Um, yes, Ray Marine uh, says uh, the Anamia protocol, uh, they call it CTALK, they make it proprietary stuff uh, and call it next generation and it should be now uh, 10 megabit Ethernet. But you can see already some of the systems. The yellow part, this is the, all the stuff that's needed for autopilot system. Then uh, here's the, some remote control units. Here we have also one, and here are the other systems uh, connected all together. So this is everything on the Canvas system. And here also the other stuff of them with wind speed meters and so on. Yeah. That was for that stuff. Then we have uh, services that we're using. Uh, so the vessel traffic services, like uh, as we have it in the, um, in the aircraft industry, they're using it mostly in the harbors that they can see, OK, here is a ship, uh, and we have to navigate it uh, to that position. So here is your parking position, or here is your unloading position, and so on. And they're um, connecting all the information uh, and sending it over the VTS. And it using the uh, mandatory is they're using the AIS system. We see it later. So the AIS system is an automatic identification system. So it um, operating normally on uh, VHF transmitters, but it could also be done on um, over satellite. And um, the thing is that the AIS in, uh, system using GPS information from the GPS receiver and putting the information in the AIS protocols. So, and as we learned, the AIS is then used for the VTS. So it's a little bit confusing, but um, that's a basic understanding that you have to have for that. So, um, da -dum -da -dum -da -dum. yeah, like similar to GPS, and uh, GPS should be normally the primary uh, navigation but uh, they're starting more and more to rely on automatic navigation systems when you have two different GPS systems. If this is a good idea, I don't know. Um, yeah. Okay, then we have one very necessary services. We, uh, every time when we go on the water, we need uh, charts of uh, the water where we travel. So, and therefore, there's an electronic chart display and information system called ACTIS. So the ACTIS system has a, a digital card map like Google Maps for waters and uh, waterways. And there are also, as we can see here, the deep of the water is also displayed in it and the position of uh, our ship and position of other ships. And uh, the speed and the heading, uh, the course that we are using. And the thing that we have to know is the ACTIS information uh, using yeah, radar, navtex, automatic AIS system. So the active system is also using the AIS. And the AIS getting the information from GPS. So that's how they combining together. And last but not least, we have the IT equipment stuff on board. So internet access, for example, over GSM, Wi-Fi, or satellite communication. And we have uh, also entertainment systems, um, yeah, Wi-Fi stuff for the crew, for the guests, or for the owners, or for uh, remote monitoring of machines or something like that. And sometimes we have also voice over IP systems. Um, yeah. To get an idea about IT equipment on board, so this is a server rack on a 40-meter yacht. So here we have the router for the internet, we have three servers here. We have uh, two voice over IP gateways for the internal uh, telephone system. We have a fully equipped switch, and we have a UPS device. And some other stuff, like uh, 10 smart TVs in the cabins, uh, one chart PCs, and um, 14 voice over IP telephones, and so on. And four access points for Wi-Fi coverage. I know from a 70 meter yacht, they have already not four access points, they have 26 access points on the ship in the 70 meters class. So if it's becoming more and more, so you have more and more stuff on the ships. 
what else have we? So, um, yeah, you can say yachts are becoming more and more smart ships. You can control most of the systems on board, like the lightning control, the, uh, the curtain <coughs> control, and so on. You can uh, look at the engine uh, monitoring. You can uh, take a look at the rudders um, and so on. Um, and all that stuff is displayed on your mobile devices like iPads or tablets or whatever. And also in the entertainment system, you can play your videos and audio and so on. So all that stuff you can control already. So what kind of attack vectors we have then? So I draw then a network map about that, how, how I understand how the network is working. So from the attack side, we have, uh, OK, we can go over the air. Um, let's take attack in the internet routers, uh, the satellite system, or, so, or that part. Um, or we can try to attacking the computer devices of the, uh, the crew or the, or the owner of the ship by social engineering attacks, for example, or spear phishing or phishing, and so on. Another thing is. Uh, Maybe we can try to uh, manipulate uh, mobile end devices like mobile phones or tablets. And once we are in, we can look for vulnerabilities in the gateways that connect in the TCP IP network to the CAN bus. And of course, we have also other systems like, for example, the autopilot. For the autopilot, there is also a remote handheld for that. I'll show you later. So, and maybe you can directly attacking the uh, CAN bus itself. Um, yeah, these are then the different attack vectors that we have. So it's a small listing about that. Let's starting with the first things. So GNSS, um, the Global Navigation Satellite System, easier I say it, um, GPS is easier. So most people say GPS, but they mean uh, GNSS. So we have four different GPS systems. So we have the NAVSTAR GPS, that's the one from the United States. We have GLONASS, uh, that's a Russian version. We have Galileo, that's from the European Union. And we have Baidu from the Chinese. So we have four different navigation systems uh, for satellite navigation now. What is the similarity for all of them? Um, most of them using only the L1 band, so the right side. So. Um, and on the right side, uh, you see only a few frequencies that they use. So the L2 band and L5 band is more military stuff and it's encrypted. So all of the private stuff, um, or, um, uh, it's done on the L1 band. Um, the two scenarios that we have is jamming or spoofing. So jamming is quite simple, just have a uh, sender that jam the radio frequency and then it's done. And for spoofing, we have to do a little bit more. For spoofing, um, we have to spoof three satellite signals that are valid, and you, had to, um, you have to know the position of that and send the signals to the receiver. It's a little bit complicated, uh, complicated but you can do it. And um, there are devices that you can buy for that, so they called um, GPS simulators or GNSS simulators. You can buy that stuff on uh, some websites here. I've shown you one sample. I think uh, from 1,000 euro up, uh, there is no limit. And normally you use it to buy it to, um, to calibrate your stuff, uh, what you de uh, develop on GPS systems and so on. But with different antennas, uh, long range antennas and so on, you can also um, fake GPS system um, out there. But yeah, it's illegal. Another thing um, where I'm currently working on is, um, as in the introduction, the GPS system, the receiver sending the signal directly to the um, CAN bus or to the Anamia bus. This is a uh, two by two centimeter uh, system on a chip GPS receiver, and it sends out directly on two pins the GPS coordinates in an Anamia form, uh, format. Cost 13 euros. So with those small devices, you can also experiment your own stuff. 
And then you have um, their simulator software, like uh, at at, uh, atlsoft.de, there is a GPS simulator, and you can uh, inject your own GPS messages directly onto the serial bus. So when you uh, set up a bus, um, yeah, um, a lab system for yourself, then you can experiment with the things, and then you can see already, OK, I have an, a GPS receiver, I have an, uh, a device that's displaying, my, uh, for example, the GPS coordinates, how it is reacting when you um, send the messages. Oh, sorry. How uh, it reacts when you send uh, fake messages directly afterwards. So that's a nice testing sample. There's another thing that we can do. Um, there are experiments how to uh, detect GPS jamming. So GPS jamming is quite common, mostly when uh, NATO troops um, do some military exercises, then the Russians try to disturb the signals. So the Norwegians have uh, always problems with them uh, and complaining all the time that uh, the pilots have some problems with GPS uh, when the NATO maneuver is done there. So currently there is one, uh, they uh, complained already. Um, and for that, a couple of years before the US Navy starting again to teaching navigation with sextants, they stopped anyhow uh, with uh, teaching the captain's navigation uh, with sextants because of they had no time, no money, whatever. and. Um, the more and more complaints about GPS security came up. They starting, I think, four years, five years again. They starting with the um, with the training of that, and I think the first ones uh, they trained was in Germany. So, okay, security uh, of GPS. So, there is a project running from the DLR in Germany. They um, have a two by two antenna array. And uh, with this array, they can uh, validate the system signals of the GPS antennas uh, that it is coming from the air or from the side. By um, calculating about that, they know, OK, um, this is the flat antenna here. Then they can see, OK, the uh, signal is maybe coming from the side or it's coming from a satellite. So that's a very nice project about that. Uh, it's still under development. It's still in testing phase, but it's doing very well. I think in a couple of years we will see that more and more. Um, yeah, AIS system. Some basics of the AIS systems. Um, what we get for information is, like in a mobile system, we have an MMSI. That is a original um, number of that. <coughs> then uh, it gives some status information about we are at anchor, underway, or something like that, and speed, course, and so on. And. The thing is, we're running on VHF channel um, A and B on uh, 161 megahertz and 162 megahertz. It's not that much, and you can do already very nice experiments with. So take your uh, software-defined radio device, download the uh, SDL file, and um, you can already experiment with receiving your own signals. You can also fake the system when you change some uh, part of the chart, but uh, that's, as already said, illegal. Um, what else we have? I mentioned autopilot system. So currently, I have only uh, a few information about that. Um, I'm, I have lack of system that I can test with. So if someone has an, um, an yacht with an um, autopilot system with remote uh, handheld, then it would be fine when I can't come there. But this one was of that system. So this is the receiver and this is the handheld. So then I started to uh, analyzing it. OK, what is it? How it is working? So it is a remote unit for an autopilot system. So it must communicate anyhow. And um, the thing is, OK, I looked up with the pictures on the websites uh, and I found then the device, and then FCC ID is your friend. Then you find, OK, it's an autopilot system from maybe Raymarine, uh, and it's communicating on 2.45 gigahertz. It's not wireless. Uh, not, no, it's wireless, yes, but it's not Wi-Fi. It's something different. So it comes out uh, on the FCC ID website. You find information about 
okay, they're using an Admega uh, 64 microprocessor and they're using their own protocol stack called Ember stack on it. And uh, yeah, that's the part now. With this information, I'm now needing um, RF signals on, with an hack RF or something like that, and then I can start to analyze it. But it's a future project, maybe next year. Now we come to the main part that I found. Um, so, as I mentioned, the story with the, with the naval ship uh, and the accident, my story started maybe one year in front of that. So I was building uh, an internet system into an, uh, in a yacht of a friend, and uh, at the end of it, uh, I explained to the captain how the system is working. So I started my Wireshark on the laptop, uh, analyzed how the software is working. We're drinking a bottle of wine. I explained everything to him, and then so, okay. And after that, so I opened my Wireshark dumps that I've made, and then I looked into the protocols. And that's the story, what we see now. So this was the system, by the way. It's an, um, yeah, it's, it's a vendor local marine, but it's a Microtech device inside. And uh, this one is a Microtech um, um, yeah, Wi-Fi extender. The extender is quite hard, so we can have 15 nautical miles Wi-Fi access. So because it has 1.6 watt electrical energy on the Wi-Fi booster, and also wi um, GSM access we have. So this is the software, and what the software does is Okay, the software connects. When you start a software, it, it connects with FTP to the router. So, what the fuck? Uh, then it downloads an XML file. This XML file uh, is then on your computer or your tablet or whatever. You change something in the configuration and then it's the, uh, uploading the XML file back to the router and everything over FTP. So, I had now the dumps all, uh, from the Wireshark session and um, it turns out, yeah, FTP is clear text, and they're using hard-coded credentials. So why? Um, the username is Loco. Um, for all the Spanish people here, Loco is something mad or, uh, yeah. And I love the password, secure connecting user. <laughs> it's still funny. OK, this uh, also then, yeah, and then after recognizing this, so hmm, they're using FTP, uh, there must be more, there must be more. And then I looked up, OK, taking IL Spy, loaded the software in, uh, in the IL Spy disassembler, and uh, looking to all the systems. And then we find, uh, OK, there is an, one, and, um, the Yacht Router engine. And it has uh, the username, the password, and uh, IP addresses, and so on, and also the Wi Fi configuration about that. What else we can do with that? So the device is also not able to configure a firewall for that. So when you make a port scan from the internet, you find a couple of different ports there. And look at the MicroTik router version. This is, by the way, from the patched version after I reported to that. So, but it's even still outdated. Um, then I have another thing. They have remote support. Um, you call them. And that's it. You say your serial number and the time when they should uh, look on your system. You don't have to provide an IP address. So how they know it? So every time when you open the uh, system, it makes a ping back to the owner of the company. So the IP address here, what we see is then uh, the local marine uh, owner of the company. Yeah. So they're making a ping back, and they know, OK, this is the IP address of that box at that time. So OK, how the remote support can then access the system? So from the port scan, there was the port uh, 8291. 8 port, uh, 8291 is a Winbox management for MicroTIG routers. So as you remember, maybe from the FTP, hard-coded credentials, user uh, local password secure connecting user. Try to connect with the Winbox management to the IP address and you're done. And you're root on that system now. Yeah? Seriously. <laughs> um, yeah. 
you had no ab uh, ability to configure a firewall or something like that in the front end on your device, but with the Winbox management software, you can do anything what you want. So it's, uh, and you have root access. So the other thing is also in the software, the Yacht router user that's hard coded is loco, and there is a developer account called Yere. And it has also uh, still access to the system. So even when you are able to change that, the developer has still access to the box. So, OK, I reported then everything to them. So um, there are some other stuff. When you don't have an idea how to uh, get the, I, um, the usernames, you can try uh, mkbrutos to open um, uh, microtik routers or versions below 642. With this CVE, just um, use the Python script and the IP address, and then it gets you back the username and the password. So this is still working. Uh, the vendor response was very nice. Uh, I talked to them. They allowed me to present that all the stuff. Um, they sent me also a test device. Um, and then I looked up what they patched. So they're using now SSH and not FTP anymore. When you try to disassemble the software, you get error messages. Um, but it, this is only for the Windows version. Um, when you try to hide secrets by obfuscating, don't forget the applications uh, for your iOS version, and don't forget your applications for the Android versions. So the Windows version, I was not able to disassemble. Uh, I'm not, but a friend of mine helped me then. But uh, I take the easier way. I take the uh, APK from uh, Android, downloaded it, and then here we go again. So they changed the username to local. They st still let it be. And this is a new password. OK, it's a strong password now, but you can still download it from the web page. Uh, this one doesn't matter. So um, yeah, the summary, they obfuscated but forget some things. The Android APK was not obfuscated, the iOS also not. They're still using hard-coded credentials, and that's not funny. Um, and yeah, you can do more with that. Now I come to the last part of the thing. So SETCOM systems is another way. So when you have no Wi-Fi coverage or GSM coverage, you can communicate with the system on a high C over SETCOM. This is a picture that I've done in the harbor of Sochi. Um, and these are then the satellite bubbles where the communication is done. Some of them are antenna for TV, and some are for internet communication. So yeah, as I said, offshore internet access. Um, many of the versions are old and outdated. And um, a couple of researchers already found some systems, so Sailor 900, Inmasa, Telenor. These are already common search hints for showdown that you can use, and then you find systems for that. And uh, yeah, showdown has also a ship tracker. So shiptracker.showdown.io, then you can see uh, ships online that using the VZ system for uh, satellite communication. And who exposing their web services there. But there is more. So I, for my local marine stuff, I was researching for more and more. And then I found a hint, stabilized digital antenna system. So hey, wow, sounds interesting. Then I uh, looked up more. And um, with this search term, you find then the devices better. So there are a couple of them online. And yeah, what it is, um, I started then with Fiddler or Burp Suite to analyze the front end of that. So it is then, um, then an antenna system itself. It has an ICU unit. And it's um, the ICU, it's more here in that part. And then it has an um, below deck then the computer and an MXP. So it's a media exchange part, uh, the part. So that's the thing where we go to the demo, because now we're going live. My internet is working, so I'm using Showdown. Just let's look how many systems are on. OK, today we have 17 satellite systems from that that are online. 
what we have here. We have uh, Singapore, US, Italy, Brazil, Poland, and so on. So it doesn't matter, so just pick one here. Dun, 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 dun. Just take come. Just take the web server. Hopefully it works, I don't know. So satellite communication is very slow, but sometimes also not working. Can we try another one? Maybe it takes too long. Mm. Come on, US. Oh, this is looking good. So this is now the front end that's coming up um, in a few seconds from one of those devices. So now you can log in with username and password when you have one. By the way, uh, when you read the documentation, uh, username and password are in the documentations. Some of them working still. So, but this is not the part here. So what I done then, so OK. I looked at the source code of the web page. And what paid my attention one then was then JavaScript user login. So I loaded it. And then we have the JavaScript here. Scroll a little bit down because it's blah, 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 blah. This is then the funny part. OK, if logged in as dealer, uh, OK. Let's try to get the ULL called this. Mm, this is the web page. And here we go. <laughs> it's taking a little bit longer. Um, I can switch back to the presentation because I have some screenshots here. <laughs> Later, later. Um, yeah. As said, in the uh, user log in JavaScript, this is the part that gives you access to the box. This is then one of the screenshots there. This is, an, is another ship then. Um, signal is not very good. But it gives you also the coordinates of the ship. So you can look up then with other websites uh, to analyze it if the information is true or not. And when you look at the configuration panes that you have here, this one is nice, command line interface, or position antenna, or test, or whatever. So this one is then the command line interface. It gives you a, a few things that you can do, and also a show all command. This you can then also um, do with, with your own scripts then uh, when you want. So a firmware upgrade um, possibility is also there, and so on. So you can dump files on there. Um, I think a couple of weeks ago, uh, someone mentioned already uh, how big is the storage. Uh, maybe we can um, dump illegal files on satellite systems, and uh, nobody will take care about that, because it's anywhere out on the high sea. And as I already mentioned, uh, username and passwords are here from the documentation. Mostly they are also working. And then, um, OK, I was thinking about, hmm, someone uh, has already found it, because uh, yeah, I was looking up the CVE pages, if someone has found it, and then, yeah, fuck, someone was faster than I. Uh, but he only um, tested for one version, and I tested for I think all of the versions of that. Um, and yeah. And then I spoke also with a vendor um, about the vulnerabilities. And they said they have a an, uh, an version fixed. Every version greater than 200, um, they are fixed now with these vulnerabilities. So the, the 186 is from May this year. 
And uh, yeah, but the problem is how to patch those systems when they're on high C. So when they're when they're running, there is no av uh, availability about that. Okay, then these are some other file system uh, things that you can do with that. Um, yeah, what is the risk now with that? Yeah, you can increase the cost of that, or you can shut up the service. So denial of service about. So when you uh, shut up the satellite communication for a ship when it is on high sea, it could be fucked up then uh, to get those information um, maybe of, okay, I'm arriving in a couple of days, uh, is there space for me for unloading my ship um, and other things. And um, I have an, also a new vulnerability in another system. Um, so I cannot release it, but this is a part of my source code for that. Um, and what does it do? So it sends a couple of requests to the web page. And uh, then the system is doing an, a configuration file dump into the temp folder of the web server. And then after a couple of seconds, you can go to the web page and download the configuration file with all the information in it. And this is uh, one part of the configuration file. Um, you see then uh, a couple of details here and do not modify the section and so on. So what else is on ships? So this is now engine control unit, a part of it. Um, it's connected to the internet and it has also a mod bus. So different things on that. So this is, um, I think from uh, DCU, it's from, from Automaskin. Um, the picture. So um, the engine control units are also connected to the network. So I know from uh, da uh, from Brian Olson, he did a um, very good presentation about uh, stuff in the engine control units. They found vulnerabilities in auto masking systems on the Mudbox, on the Ethernet ramp, uh, one and so on. So hard coded credentials also in that uh, in that part here and so on, and you are able to uh, manipulate parameters of the engines. Um, but there's an, 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 yeah, you have to watch the presentation from Brian Olson for that. Um, what else? So all this stuff is then connected together, and now we're coming to autonomous ships. So autonomous ships then, maybe crewless driving uh, without any crew members, and navigate by satellite systems and relying on those vulnerability systems like AIS and GPS and so on. So they, they're building autonomous vehicles on insecure systems. So what could then happen, I would not imagine, but maybe we will see something. This is then an overview of what we see. So manned ships, radar, actors, and visual. And uh, in autonomous ships, we're only using radar, actors, and visual uh, from a remote controller, maybe, or only controlled by ship uh, computers. So, yeah. There are already autonomous ships. So uh, Rolls-Royce had last year a showcase with the first completely autonomous uh, um, ship. So they undocked. Um, going through um, through another pier, then uh, docked again, and then uh, depart back again, and then go to the original um, thing. So for safety reason, they had a uh, captain on the bridge here, just in case the uh, autonomous system is not working. But everything else was then done by a remote control unit. So when you then look a little bit more on the web pages from Rolls Royce. They have a six-page paper about um, safety and so on, but only a one small sentence like this about cybersecurity risk. So it's more advertising stuff than other things. Yeah, what's next? Um, the Anamea stuff should be more explored. Wireless autopilot, maybe I or someone else can do it. Um, the other internet stuff uh, has to be checked up. Um, I can say vessel hacking is just in the beginning because there are so many things to do, so many things to research. Cloud services come also more and more. Um, you see here one of those systems. 
the part that already connected, they put it in the cloud service and then you have remote access from any place of the world uh, with your mobile devices. If that is a good idea, hmm, I don't know. Yeah, cloud services as already mentioned. Um, and yeah, VTS is also not really uh, explored. Um, injecting NMEA messages, it's the thing that I already mentioned. And GFS spoofing protections, I think it will come in the next two, three, four, five years. I don't know. Yeah. Um, and uh, I want to say, oh, it was a wrong one. <laughs> it's a bad one. So that was here Brian Satira and Brian Olsen for their ship hacking pirate things uh, at the DerbyCon. And yeah, my employer thanks that I always can attend those uh, nice conferences and the ability here and all my friends here and you for the way uh, to attend my talk. So then I'm done with that. May the force be with you. As already mentioned, my Twitter handle or my email address. If you have any questions. Thank you, Stefan. And go ahead. Questions. We have new duties. The first uh, question is here. We'll be taking six questions and then we'll be heading off to lunch. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the user IDs and passwords. Are those hard coded or can they be changed? The, the user ID ones. and password in the router or in the setcom? Uh, in either one of them. Are those all hard coded or can they be changed? They, most, no, they are hard coded and you cannot change it. Uh, even in that devices, uh, yeah, in the setcom device, you can change, but they don't change it. Right. But in the local marine stuff, they are hard coded and you cannot change. <laughs> okay. Please raise your questions for the yeah, there is one. your hands for the questions. Okay. Uh, we have. Uh, here we have two, and you also. Okay. Okay. Raise your hands, please, so Joanna yeah, can uh, see you. The first one. Hey, how long did uh, this research took you? To pardon me? How how long did you do this research? Uh, I'm doing it uh, since two years now. Oh, that's a lot. So uh, all the, always when I have time, uh, spare time, then uh, I dig into it. Always when I am on the ship, then I uh, try to figure out something new uh, to gamble with that. Um, so a friend of mine has a uh, sailing yacht, and uh, I sometimes visit him, him and uh, we try to figure out some stuff. And yeah, so it's still ongoing. Thanks. So I think um, the third row was first. Thank you. The, um, next question right next to him. The oh, there. Just next go to ahead. the person that asked the question now. Uh, how did you manage to stumble upon this uh, discovery with the, the vulnerabilities? You pardon me? How did you manage to stumble upon the vulnerabilities of the system? And uh, in which way did the company respond? I didn't quite get it from the presentation. Okay. Um, yeah, the question was how, uh, how I managed to, to disclose the vulnerabilities. So I contact them. Um, the one vendor I contacted by email, and the, one, uh, the other vendor I contacted only over the web page because they had no email address for, for reporting vulnerabilities. So I put my emails um, on the web page. I, I reported everything and then um, give the information, so please contact me. And one week later, then they contacted me. Thank you. So we'll be taking next the question here. So here, here there were here. one waiting. And then we'll be going back to you guys in the back. And you'll be towards the end. Thanks. So uh, you mentioned that the architecture for the network in the yachts is similar to those in the automotive industry. Um, would the hacking a, let's say, luxury caravan that has much of the same functionalities as the yachts, would one go about in the same way? Would they have different attack vectors or? Uh... Mm, was it with caravans or? Oh uh, yeah, luxury caravans, I don't know. Uh, like big houses on wheels with sat uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think most of the same problems they have. But um, in the automotive uh, industry, the, um, the CAN bus is a little bit different. So everyone does his own stuff and own protocols on it. And in the, um, yeah, in the maritime sector, they have a standardized uh, CAN bus. And once you know how it is working, then you know the other things. Thank you. And there is no encryption yet on it. Thank you. We'll be going 
in that area. So there were. No, I'm I'm remembering you. I I won't forget you. Um. Helen, I want also to ask. <laughs> Hi. Okay, first. Um, so thank you for the, for your presentation. I was half expecting in fear in the what's next slide to see in upper case airplanes. So airplanes was, is a different story. I was actually wondering, and that that would be my question, if you would be. Oops, microphone is not working. So oh, yeah. if you would be interested to use that approach, which was very methodological, to you know, switch to airplanes or actually do some research? Or if you know if there's any security research around this? Thank you. Uh, to be honest, I, I know something about the aircraft industry, but uh, I think it's a little bit different there. But I'm not really uh, was analyzing uh, aircraft um, problems there. So I know that um, in the aircraft industry that you navigate in a different way, but also relying on GPS sig uh, signals. But they are jamming GPS signals um, from down. It's possible, yeah, but um, they have also alternate systems. And they also require to navigate by visual and other systems. So yeah, um, it's a little bit different, yeah, but uh, I'm not really sure uh, what what you can do there. Thank you. Um, going to the next question. There, here was one. Oh, yeah. I, we'll, oh. We'll, we'll. Oh, sorry, yeah. Short one. Is NMEA a national or an international organization, and how do they handle security? Pardon me? Is NMEA is a national or international organization, and how do they handle security, if you know anything about it? So NMEA is only the standardization um, environment for standardization, the messages that's going on over the network. Yeah, it uh, starts with N from national, um, or it's... I don't know no. if they have a, a security thing inside now, so never Thank handled you. it we'll in detail coming, yet. We'll be coming here with in, in, in the front row, and... I'm sorry, but this will be our last question. I will invite you Hi, guys thank to have a private talk afterwards. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. For Thank you for the talk. Um, I have a more general question on, on the response side because this is very similar to other industries like automotive and yeah. aviation and uh, healthcare. Uh, and on, at least on the automotive and healthcare side of things, there's been some movement from the regulators like the National Highway Safety Authority in the US uh, administration and the FDA and, and all those. Uh, are there similar organizations, regulatory organizations uh, for naval vessels? And are they, what's your opinion about that? Are they, they do they show any interest in cybersecurity issues? Do they want to mm, uh, yeah. bring the vendors to the table and try to, to fix some of the stuff? Or is it like not Yeah, so good question, uh, by the way. Um, there are regulations um, for also for cybersecurity, but mostly for ships bigger than 300 tons uh, are regulated also under solar. So that's a different um, different sector. So for commercial ships regulated under the solar requirements, they have to be uh, follow some safety and security guidelines, and also cybersecurity is um, more and more mandatory for them. But for the private sector of for, from yachts, uh, yachts and so on, so. There is not really a regulation yet, so that's that's why I'm focused only on that because uh, it's it's a broader playground, so it's not really regulated uh, very well now, and maybe also the people are not aware about that. So mostly of the yacht owners, I think, not aware about that. I guess yeah, that yeah, may, uh, from the GPS things uh, maybe yeah, but uh, the other risk about attacking their internet stuff on board, um, it's a different thing. Thank you for yeah. your attendance, and please do approach Stefan for further questions and, and discussions over lunch, maybe, here around. Thank you very I'm much, Stefan, for, for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.